Okay, Chosen Frozen, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 15. We're going to now head into, guys, the second leg, if you will, of the final night of the earth, earthly life of Christ before he goes to the cross. Again, guys, super important material that we're studying here. We've got the Lord's last words, and we know that last words are always what? Filled with insight, pregnant with meaning. When somebody's about to go to their grave, they're not talking about the weather. They're not talking about who won the national championship, right? Only these words, the words you and I have before us now, they're not coming from an, any ordinary human. These are th the very last words of the author of light and life himself, right? So let's endeavor to really dig in here. Don't be falling asleep at the wheel. If you got decaf, I tricked you because I put regular in there. And uh, yeah, here we go. Now, we've been studying for the last month what you and I have come to know as the Last Supper. Judas is out there swinging his deal with the religious leaders, and Christ has been sowing into the eleven over this very last intimate meal with them, slowly bringing them to an understanding that he is marching to his death. Now, where we left off in the very last verse of chapter 14... Chapter four, uh, 14, verse 31, Christ said, all right, guys, dinner's over. Let's get up now. Let's move from this place. We're going to take a little walk. So that's why I'm saying we're sort of on the second leg then of this final night of the life of Christ, where they are leaving the upper room. They are beginning now their march over to the Garden of Gethsemane. Many of you have heard that name. Evidently, Jesus was very fond of this garden. He had a habit of stopping and praying there with a great deal of frequency, no doubt in part because the Garden of Gethsemane was a very isolated location. Now, remember, it was this information that Judas was selling to the authorities. Okay? Remember, Christ is at the height of his popularity here, so their plan is to arrest him very privately, drag him through three of their courts, if you will, behind closed doors, and then go to the people and say, look, this man has been found guilty in our courts. So they need to find a place where they can pounce on Christ in isolation, and Judah says, hey, for 30 pieces of silver, I know just the place, okay? Now... Christ knows the score. He knows exactly what's around the corner. You remember he said, I lay down my own life of my own accord. Nobody takes it from me. So again, where we left off last week, guys, let's get up. Let's get on the move here. And he begins to walk now with the 11 through the Kidron Valley along the side of the Mount of Olives uh, to this garden now that he's been very fond of praying in. What we have now, what we've got recorded for us in chapters 15, 16, and 17 is what he told the boys on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? We've got ringside seats here, guys, to maybe the most important conversation the Lord ever had with his disciples, and it is filled with remarkable and practical insight for you and I. Now, the backdrop here, what I, what I find incredibly interesting is that as they are leaving Jerusalem, they are going to be passing right by the temple. Okay? Now, Herod was in charge of building this temple. And some of you Bible students, you know that Herod was sort of a, an over-the-top kind of guy when it came to deco. Okay? There were these two large iron gates that he had overlaid with gold and uh, these large clusters of grapes and vines on these gates overlaid with gold. It was thought that the ornamentation of these gates alone with the grapes and the vines and so forth ran up the construction costs of, of the temple to about $12 million of, of our dollars today. Now, if some of you read ahead, you're starting to put a little bit of this together. And by the way, always read ahead. You will always get so much more out of the text you spend some time with the Lord reading it uh, beforehand. So, Christ is going to be speaking of vines and branches and fruit and these kinds of things. Remember, a very agrarian culture back then, agriculture intensive. Some of this stuff sounds a little foreign to us. But he's going to be speaking about vines, branches, grapes, and so forth. And he's going to be doing so as they are walking by these extravagant gates depicting these gold-plated Grapes and vines. 
And we know it's a full moon because it's Passover, so it's reasonable to assume we've got good visibility going on here, okay? Now, because of that, some have engaged in speculation that this material you and I are about to read, very popular material, was inspired by you know, these, these gates that Herod had put together. You know, well, guys, see those grapes and vines over there? Well, that reminds me. Let me tell you a little story. I do not think that is the case. I don't buy that for a minute because Christ is not inspired by the works of men, but rather by the love and heart of his heavenly Father. I think what we've got going on here, though, is nothing more than the extravagant providence of God. Okay, how that... When you go through the scriptures, you come to this understanding that God has the whole deal wired. And I see this scene as just another example of that. You guys remember, most some of you, when we studied the book of Joshua, how that the priests were getting ready to cross the Jordan River in high, high flood season. And the second that they put their feet in the water, the, the water had stopped flowing. And we discovered there that 19 miles up the river, the Lord had cut off the water knowing exactly when the priests were going to put their, their feet in the water. So I think this is just the providence of God, guys. Another example of that beautiful, remarkably poetic providence on the part of God here. Now, over the years, I will say this. I have heard a lot of goofy sermons that have been taken from the opening uh, verses of chapter 15. Okay, Probably more so than maybe any other passages in the gospel. But I think if we pay very close attention to what it is exactly that Christ is saying and we marry that with the historical and cultural context of what's going on here, I think we're going to have real clarity um, given uh, to the situation. Traditionally, what we have here as a result of these errors is just a mischaracterization of the heart of the Heavenly Father, and we're going to clear that up. So picture the scene in your mind. Jesus is leaving town with the 11. It's the night before the crucifixion. Okay, they're leaving Jerusalem. And shortly then thereafter, you've got Judas now. He's going to be leaving with the temple guard. And these two groups are going to come together. They're going to intersect at this garden of Gethsemane. So let's dig in tonight and pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 15 with some very familiar and and precious language uh, to you and I. Uh, Tony Joe, let's read just verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Okay. Well, to get a hold of this, we first need to understand that in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was known as the vine of God. Israel was known as the vineyard of God. Okay, Psalm 80, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. Isaiah 5, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. Many, many other scriptures we could go on and on. The disciples, this picture, would not have been lost on them. Very familiar term, okay? Now, when you read the Old Testament, you discover a father that is deeply interested in the welfare of the vineyard, okay? He says in Isaiah 5, through the prophet Isaiah, let me sing for my beloved a love song about my vineyard. I've watered you, I've tended you. Speaking of the promised land, he says, I, I've put you in the best possible soil. I planted you in, in just the choicest place. Okay? Notice that Jesus says here, the Father. He's not calling himself the vine dresser. The father is the vine dresser. The father is is the gardener. And this gives us a little bit different of a spin than we're used to maybe with the heavenly father, right? Because we tend to think of the heavenly father as the the hard-nosed of the Godhead, right? And then Jesus comes to us as the kindler, gentler version from the Godhead. And yet here, What we have is that the Heavenly Father is deeply interested in our welfare. And man, are we ever going to develop this in the text that we have here. Remember, the Father is in view here, okay? Now, the problem with Israel, of course, is they never really did respond to the care that was given them by the gardener or the vine dresser, okay? Whenever you read of Israel being the vineyard or the vine of God, disappointment in the voice of God was right around the corner. One of those chapters that we've quoted already, Isaiah 5. If you continue to read through Isaiah 5, the prophet then says on behalf of the Father, things like, well, what more could I have done for you? I've cared for you. 
I have totally set you guys up. And instead of bringing forth good grapes, you've brought forth wild grapes, Isaiah 5.3. He said through the prophet Jeremiah, I planted you as a noble vine. How then have you turned into this strange alien plant? Okay, on and on we could go. Hosea said, you are the empty vine. You bring forth the fruit of yourself. God was essentially saying to Israel over and over in the New Testament, look, look at what you've become. Look at how you've turned out. You, you were originally to be this glorious vineyard bringing forth all this fruit. And now look at you. It was the Lord's desire, guys, that Israel would be an example to all nations as the chosen people. That as they served the true and living God, God would bless them and prosper them in order that other nations would look at them and say, wow, would you look at Israel, right? Pretty awesome God they've got going on there. Maybe we need to look into that. And that is exactly what God wants going on in our lives today. He wants us now to produce this fruit that Israel could not produce. He wants us now to live the kinds of lives that when family and friends and co-workers observe the fruit that God has sown through us, that they too would want to know and serve the same God. Make sense? Okay. Notice Jesus says, I am the true vine. Underline true vine. Man is that a loaded term. And we'll try to do that justice. Okay. But just for starters here, Christ knew these guys were familiar with the term. He knew, of course, their fathers failed the Lord. And he knew that when he ascended back to the Father, man, great persecution was going to come upon these men. They would be kicked out of the synagogues of their fathers, all right? They would be kicked out of the temple. Christ is telling them, look, your relationship with religion... It's about to go south and get pretty rough, okay? But you have a relationship with God, the true vine. I am the true vine, all right? You have a relationship with God, not through organized religion, not through a system of rules and regulations. You now have a relationship with God through me. Guys, you're going to need to know this. It's going to get rough. I am the true vine, all right? That's what he's saying to them, and he's saying to you and me, Your relationship is to be with me, not a religious organization. So, Father is the gardener, Father is the vine dresser, and he has sent forth the true vine in his son. Now, there of course is much, much more to Christ calling himself the true vine here, and Jesus will now develop this for us, picking it up in verse 2. And again, if I had just a couple of bucks for each time I've heard this next set of verses pretty butchered in a sermon or book, I'd be an independently wealthy man. All right. Now, notice what Jesus says, picking it up in verse 2 now. Notice what Jesus says the Father does in his role as being the gardener, the vine dresser here. Let's look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. All right. Well, has there ever been a lot of ink spilled over this deal in commentaries over the years? And I think there are a number, again, as I said on the onset, a number of errors concerning how this verse has been taught. But don't listen to a word I tell you up here. Remember, be a good Berean, Acts 17, right? You search the scriptures for yourselves to see if what you're being taught is true. But I think there's a number of errors here, and it's a real shame, but for the fact that it's going to give us an opportunity to teach a bit about how to read and interpret your Bible. God is always clipping coupons. Now, we've got two branches, two different kinds of branches here, right? Branches that produce fruit, and we have branches that don't produce fruit. And then we have recorded how Christ says the Father then deals with these two kinds of branches concerning what I believe to be the first error here. I have heard people... And, and some strong Bible teachers, all right, and guys I, I really respect, guys like John MacArthur even, have taken the opinion here that the branch that does not produce fruit, that's the false believer. 
That's the unbeliever. That's the Judas believer, right? The one who was pretending to be something that in reality he is not. You'll understand in a minute why it's super important to get this straight. Because the key to understanding how Christ is going to develop this here is getting it right, right out of the gate. If we don't get it right, we're not going to grab the rest of it. Now, I believe very strongly, I'm going to tell you why, I believe very strongly that both of these branches are referring to saved believers. Both of them, okay? Several reasons. Number one, Bible students make a note of this. The true interpretation of any passage is often discovered by attending to the character of those being addressed. Okay? In other words, the true interpretation of a passage is discovered by considering the audience it's being given to. All right? Jesus is not here addressing a mixed multitude. He is not addressing a mixed audience. No unbelievers here. Judas is gone. That could be another debate right there, but he's gone. So we only have 11 hardcore believers, men that have left family, jobs, businesses, and we know they're all eventually going to die for Christ. Okay? So number one, we're talking to Hardcore believers only. Number two, salvation is not the issue here. This is why we're talking about both branches are saved believers. Salvation isn't the issue here. Why? Well, because he's talking to 11 hardcore believers, yeah. But number two, salvation is not the issue here because we are not saved by bearing fruit. Okay? We are not saved as a function of how much fruit we produce. You know the verse, Ephesians 2, right? We are saved by grace through faith, not by works, not by our, our fruit production, lest any of us boast in that, okay? Number three, why we're talking about two saved believers here, and as far as I'm concerned, man, this is the clincher. Notice he says there, look carefully with me at this, every branch that is in me. You see that? Underline in me. Notice this branch that does not produce fruit, nevertheless, is in me. Never is this phrase, in Christ, used loosely, all right? Never do we find this phrase anywhere in the word of God referring to anybody but the children of God. Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, right? 2 Corinthians 5. This branch has a relationship with Christ, but it's just not producing fruit. Now, you know what it is. You know, maybe you've got a friend or a relative, and maybe you led them to the Lord yourself, and you've prayed for them, but just, man, they, they just can't get it on the rails. You know, they just go from one train wreck to another, and you're just wishing they could get their deal together, right? Now, you know they're struggling as far as producing fruit is concerned, but you're not quite comfortable sending them off to hell, so to speak, either. There's just something in you that's telling you, hey, God is dealing with this person still. Okay? This is what I believe Christ is referring to here. There are some believers that, man, they just have great difficulty producing fruit in their life. There just seems to be an absence of fruit. And God is still dealing with them, and we're going to see that in a minute. Now, the other branch, there are other people that, man, you look at their life and it's just a cornucopia, right? I mean, there's just fruit coming out all over the place. I mean, God's just bringing forth abundant fruit in their life. So we've got two types of branches here, and yet they are both believers, okay? So if we've got that straight, we can now proceed with the rest of this development, and you will see how the rest of this development confirms where we're going here. Now, let's move then to how, because that's the subject of this text, let's move to how the Father then deals with these two types of branches. Notice with the branch, first of all, that is not producing fruit, notice that it says, he takes him away. Underline that. Takes him away. Or takes away, okay? If you've got an NIV or a New Living, don't be bringing a 
Knife to a gunfight, okay? <laughs> I've told you I don't care for that, the, the NIV, that translation, and it, over and over you'll see departures from, from the original language. This is a great example. The NIV has cut off here. If you've got an NIV and it says cut off, horrible translation. Ask about that in the Q&A if you want later. This Greek word for take away, tune in, is airo, A-I-R-O, okay? And it means literally to lift up. It means to elevate. It has the idea of loosing something that's got a weight upon it, okay? In Luke 17, 13, when it says they lifted up their voices, same Greek word, iro, there. Back in John 11, when it says Jesus lifted up his eyes, John eleven forty one, you've got the Greek word iro, there. In Revelation 10, 5, this angel is, is lifting up his hand to heaven, you guessed it, Iro. We could go on, okay? This word in the original language means to lift up, it means to elevate, and that is what Jesus is telling us that the Father does with the saved believer that does not bear fruit. He lifts them, them up. He tends to those who are struggling, okay? This is going to make more sense in a minute. But let's kill the error here first. This is not a picture of the father casting the unbeliever into the fire. All right, This is not a picture of the father sending the unbeliever to hell. This is not a picture, Bible students, of judgment. This is not a picture of judgment. How do we know that? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'll tell you. Because this is talking about how the father deals with these branches, right? The Father does not judge. John 5.22, the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, you see. This verse is describing what the Father does, and the Father is not the one in the Bible that does the the judging. That job he has given to Jesus. It is Christ who is going to say on that day, depart and go into outer darkness. All right? This is conclusive proof, friends, that the unbeliever is not here in view. Okay, salvation is not here in view. The abiding and the fruit bearing of the believer is, and you'll see that in a minute, because there's real beauty here. Let's bring it home. Let's bring it home. When you and I visualize a vineyard in our mind, what we have pictured there is the vine coming out, you know, and coming out of the ground, and then the branches will go out horizontally on a, on a fence or some kind of a wire or a trellis or whatever. But in the time of Christ, grapevines just grew on the ground, man. Okay? The vine came out, and the branches were left to just spread out on top of the ground wherever they wanted to. This is another Bible study, but I see a picture of religion and the way we do it now. So we've got to get them all up on the wire and on the fence and organize it in the trenches. In the time of Christ, they, they, they were to spread out over the ground, sort of like the, the branches spreading the gospel, okay? Great picture of the gospel there, but that's not where, where, where I want to rest, okay? So in the time of Christ, the, 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 man, the grapevines just grew out on the ground. But then rain and dirt and mud would come and cover and bury some of these branches, right? And so with that branch that's not bearing fruit, the vine dresser, the gardener, comes along and he begins to lift up, to elevate this this branch that just has been downtrodden by mud and clay, and he, he begins to remove the dirt of the earth and free the branch, elevates the branch in order that it might bear fruit again, okay? This is not a picture of the Heavenly Father going through the church and saying, well, I've had a belly full of you, buddy, now out into destruction you go. That's not what's happening here. This is beautiful. Listen, to the believer that's struggling, the believer that just can't seem to get his life back on the rails again, the heavenly father, the vine dresser, the father comes, he lifts them up, he frees them from the dirt of this earth and this world. All right, this is the beautiful picture. He's not there to destroy them. He has come there in order to restore them into a condition where they can then begin to bear fruit. All right? You see that? Now, to the branch that is, the other branch, to the branch that is bringing forth fruit, he says the Father prunes that branch. Underline prunes or purges. 
Purges is a better word. You'll only find that if you've got a King Jimmy. Okay? But underline prunes or purge. Here we've got another error, typically. And the error is this. To the branch that is bearing fruit, well, God comes and prunes that sucker. This has created the idea that you don't ever want to give God the idea that you're doing really well, all right? Because you know what's coming down the pike. If he sees you having too much of a good time, he's going to swoop down and lower the boom on you, right? So stay under God's radar. You want to be sort of happy, but not too happy, because if you're too happy, you're going to draw his attention, and you don't want the Job deal coming your way, right? Man, we do not want that to be duplicated in our lives, so don't act too happy. Keep a lot of money hidden offshore. Make sure that God doesn't think you're prospering too well. The error, in short, is this. I don't want to be doing too good, because then here comes the Jesus with the hedge clippers in hand, and man, I'm going to get cut down to size. Have you been taught that? This word for prune here in the Greek, and again, purge in the King Jimmy is a better translation. It means to cleanse, literally, all right? It means to wash. The word is kephiro. It's where we get our word catharsis from. It has the idea of a cleansing process. Now, it doesn't make too much sense in our culture, but it made perfect sense for the culture within which it was written. You see, it was a very common sight in the time of Christ for a vine dresser to be taking buckets of water through his vineyard. And what he would do is he would take the developing grapes and he would begin to dip them into this bucket and wash them, washing off the dust, washing off the parasites, washing off the insects or whatever it was that was choking the life force from coming from the vine into the branches, all right? He would wash away whatever it was that was obstructing that flow. Also, there might be an even greater harvest, okay? So listen, the use of the word prune, prune or purge here does not, does not have the image of God pulling out the machete and starting to hack away at your life, okay? That's a bunch of garbage. This word means to cleanse. It means to wash. For the believer that is bringing forth fruit, God wants to come alongside you and he wants to cleanse your life. He wants to remove whatever irritants have been introduced into your life in order that you can bring, even, uh, bring forth even more fruit. Now, if you look at yourself and you're thinking, well, you know, I'm doing okay, I... I think I've got a certain degree of fruit going on here. Well, that's wonderful. Awesome. But yet God loves you so much, he wants you to bring forth even more fruit. He has so much yet more for you. Okay? Now, if there is any doubt that this is what the counsel of God is talking about here, verse 3 ought to put this to bed for you in pretty short order. Uh, Tony, let's look at verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Okay, there it is. Same Greek word, clean. Underline that. Also underline the word. The two words, the word. Okay. Very same root word we just saw in verse 2. Okay. Only this is the adjective form of the verb we just saw. Okay. What we just saw in verb verse 2 was too clean, okay? This word means clean. It's already clean, okay? Same Greek word, kathairo and kathairos. So, we're talking about a cleansing here, okay? This is not a cutting away. It is a washing off. Now, class, what is the cleansing agent? It is the water of the word of God, Boy, do we just see this over and over and over, don't we? And it's beautiful. Jesus said, you are clean because of my word. Underline the word. What else do we already know? That in Bible typology, water is a picture of what, guys? The word of God. You remember Paul told the Ephesians, wash yourselves in the water of the word of God. So Christ is saying, look, you're producing fruit. This is great. 
to that branch that is producing fruit, okay? But I want you to produce more fruit, and so my Father's going to come, and he's going to be washing and cleansing your life from all the irritants and all the junk and all the muck that you're picking up in the world, all right? My Father's desire is to wash you in the water of the word of God. Friends, we are told over and over and over, because we're so thick, we need it, we're being told over and over in the scriptures that the word of God has a cleansing effect upon our lives. With all the TV and the movies and the popular culture that we're inundated with, man, you just gotta, you gotta pull a Romans 12 and renew your mind, man, through the water of the word of God. Be in the word of God every day. Cleanse your heart from the impurities and, and, and the irritants of this world by washing yourself, allowing the Father to wash you in the word of God. Now, the reverse, the reverse is also true, Okay? You've probably talked to somebody that's maybe struggled a bit, right? And you've said to them, well, hey, man, you know what? What what has God shown you in his word as of late? And if they're honest with you, they'll say, well, you know, I I really don't read my Bible a whole lot. Just as the word of God will cause you to prosper, the absence of the word of God is going to take you in the other direction, man. Okay? It's going to take you in the other direction. That's why David said a couple of things. He said, how can a young man cleanse his way but by every word of God? Psalm 119, verse 9. A couple verses later, Lord, help me hide your word in my heart so that I don't sin against you. Guys, this is a dirty world, man. And there is a whole host of irritants out. This is a muddy place. And yet God would have us to bear fruit. And the way that we're going to bear fruit is by simply allowing his word to just wash us and cleanse us from the influence and the filth that this world uh, desires to infect us with. All right, now, as they say in infomercials, right? But wait, there's more. It gets better yet. Man, notice the incredible picture of rest we have here, picking it up in verse 4 and 5. Let's look at 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Huh, underline much in verse 5, by the way. We had not bearing fruit, we had bearing fruit. At the end of verse 2, we had more fruit. If you got a second, go back and underline more fruit at the end of verse 2. Now here in verse 5, we've got the goal, right? Much fruit. Now, if you take a branch and you cut it off from the trunk or the vine, I mean, I don't don't care how great the blossoms are from that branch, it's not going to become fruitful, all right? In order for it to bring forth fruit, it has to be connected to the trunk or the vine. We get that, right? That is what Christ is saying here. He says he is the vine, we are the branches. If we are going to produce any fruit, it is flat out not going to happen unless we remain in the vine or abide in the vine. Okay, you might have abide or remain in your translations here. That's why he says at the end of verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? So therefore, whatever spiritual fruit is in your life is there because of God. And as Mike pointed out to me yesterday, you know, this is a verse that can be taken out of context from time to time. This is talking about eternal spiritual fruit. Apart from Christ, you cannot bring forth anything of eternal value. This doesn't mean you can't pass the salt apart from Christ, okay? Okay? This is talking about eternal spiritual fruit. So do we understand how ridiculous it is for us to be prideful about what God is doing? And we have nothing to do with fruit production. The only thing, listen, the only thing we've been created to do is display it. We are display racks, not producers. When fruit has come into our life, it is not because, well, you know, I'm diligent and I pray a lot and I take my faith real seriously. (laughs) No, no. 
It has come because God is just gracious. That's all that's going on here, all right? And so rather than us boasting about how spiritual we are, we ought to just be talking about how grand and glorious and great of a God we serve. Now, this is, there's a great picture of rest in here, man. You got to mine it. This is an incredible picture of the rest we have in Christ. You remember he said what? My yoke is easy, my burden is? Right, Matthew 11. The psalmist said, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46.10. Listen, the picture here is that the fruit is produced, tune in right now if you haven't yet, as just a simple and natural byproduct of having a relationship with Christ, of remaining in the vine. If you want to be fruitful in spiritual things, you don't work it up yourself. Okay? Jesus is not saying to these guys, now give me 20. You know, get out there, fellas. I want you to give me 110%, and by golly, I want you to bring forth fruit. Sarah and I have a bunch of fruit trees in our backyard. Got um, a couple cherry trees, an apple tree, two apple trees, and a peach tree. <laughs> and when I'm, walking, when I'm walking around out there in the summer, I don't hear the branches groaning and grunting. In fact, they're very still. I see no evidence whatsoever of them working feverishly to try and bring forth fruit. I mean, they're just hanging in. They're just, that's all they do. They hang there. I mean, if they could talk, they'd say, look, we just hang in. I mean, and the fruit comes. I hang on to this trunk, and eventually I know the fruit's going to come. Listen, the same thing applies to our relationship with the Lord, man. You just hang on to Jesus Christ. You continue to cultivate your relationship with him. You desire to know him better. Now, as your love and appreciation for him grows, you're going to discover so does your desire to please him. And then just very naturally, guys, fruit will begin to just come forth from your life. Okay? Anything else, the energies in the flesh, that's just religion, man. You hang on to Christ, you know him, just love him, you're going to appreciate him more, you're going to desire to please him, and before you know it, you'll have gone like that, and there's fruit. You weren't even doing anything. All right? Now, that's a great picture of the rest that Christ is trying to tell us, guys, remain in me, abide in me. Apart from me, you can't do anything. Just abide in me, know me, love me, appreciate me. All right. Picking it up in verse 6 then. Well, we're going to get a bit serious here, evidently. Uh, let's, let's read verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Ouch! What happened to my picture of rest? Okay, well again, if you get the context wrong right out of the gate here at the top, it has a tendency to infect the rest of the interpretation. A ton of ink has been spilled over what this verse is talking about. There are those that say that this is the believer that is walking away from Christ. You know, the whole, can I lose my salvation deal? And well, you know, no, you can't lose it, but you can leave it. And this is talking about a guy that leaves it. There are others that say, no, this is talking about men going to hell, all right? This is talking about the unbeliever being cast into the lake of fire. I don't buy either of those explanations. And the reason neither of those make sense to me is because, again, the issue of salvation is not here in view. Salvation is not the context, okay? The context and the issue, what is in view, is the abiding and fruit-bearing of the believer. Now, I believe that what is going on here is what the Apostle Paul described to the church at Corinth. He said, when you and I depart from this world, there are going to be one of two examination rooms that we are going to be led to. If you've been around verse by verse, you've heard this a number of times already. For the unbeliever, there is the examination room known as the great white throne judgment. Take my word, don't want to go there. Because in that examination, your sin will be judged. 
It's the kingdom of God or a lake of fire kind of deal. And it's one indictment and one indictment only. Did you believe in the person and works of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Christ is the answer to your sin problem? No? A bye bye That's what's happening at the great white throne judgment. There's not going to be a movie or a reel with all your sins of pulling your sister's hair and stealing batteries from the drugs. You know, you're not going to see all your sins. Did you believe in Jesus? Is he the answer to your sin problem? No, bye. Okay? You don't want to go there. Two examination rooms for human beings. You're an unbeliever. It's off to the great white throne judgment. Now, for those of us who are in Christ, our sin was already judged at the cross. So we go to what Paul calls the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ or the rewards bench. The word there, Bema, was what the, uh, the Greeks in that culture used to describe the bench where their Olympics were rewarded. They, you know, the people that won these events, they would go to the Bema seat and they would receive their rewards. Okay, Unbeliever, great white throne judgment. If you're a believer, you don't go to that, that examination room. There's another one you go to. Believer goes to the Bema seat. And there we are told, now stay with me, there we are told, believers at the Bema seat, there we are told we will suffer loss of reward. Okay? There is no punishment there because the entire wrath of God for the punishment of our sins was already poured out on Christ upon that cross. But we will suffer what Paul calls loss of reward. Well, how is that? Okay? Paul, speaking of believers, said there are some who will bring forth hay, wood, and stubble, and the fire will come and burn those works, and they will suffer loss, though they themselves will be saved. 1 Corinthians 3. Then he likens uh, the good works to gold and, and silver and precious stones that somehow will survive the fire and of course there's no loss of reward there so unbelievers go to the great white throne judgment believers go to the bema seat where we will suffer loss of reward for whatever it is that we did with god that god gave us okay we will not be punished but again friends the bible teaches there are levels of reward in eternity You don't have to do anything to get saved but believe that Christ was the answer to your sin problem. But then the quality of your eternity will be impacted by what you did with what God gave you. And that's what Paul is describing the believer goes through. No punishment, just a loss of reward. Okay, So we will not be punished, but we will suffer what Paul calls a loss of reward. And that process is going to involve somehow the testing of our works by fire. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. And that, I believe, is what Christ is talking about here. Now, again, I told you there was a lot of ink spilled on this verse. There is one other explanation. Okay? Some say that what is being spoken of here is that this branch is the true believer but that, you know, this is a person that lives a very hypocritical life and that it's the men that throw away the branch. It's the men that throw away the bogus testimony of the believer into the fire. In other words, the atheist scoffing at the backsliding Christian, okay? Now, that's not as out of context as the first two errors, but I seriously doubt that's what Christ is referring to here. I believe when you bring the full counsel of God to bear upon verse 6, you're looking at a believer who will suffer loss of reward by fire for living well below the level that God intended for that believer to live upon, and yet that believer will still be saved. Clear as mud? All right. Well, then finally tonight, let's close with verses 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. All right. Well, verse 7 there, you kind of remember we studied this back in 14. Ask whatever you will in my name and that I will do. I mean, he essentially repeats that idea again here. So we're not going to spend too much time here. But I do think he lays out the conditional nature a bit more clearly than maybe in four, uh, verse 14. Notice what is shaping the life of the one that is praying here. Notice what is shaping the life of the one that is praying here. Underline the word if. If you abide in me 
and my words abide in you, then you're going to ask whatsoever you will and it'll be done. It is my relationship with the Lord. It is my abiding in him and his word abiding in my heart that is shaping my will. At the end of the day, guys, if you don't know this, know this and get this down. True prayer, true prayer is you and I simply aligning our will with his, okay? All true prayer should begin with the heart of God. All true prayer, listen, is you and I taking the will of God, turning it around and offering it right back up to him as prayer, okay? And as I am drawing near to God, and as his word is opening up my heart and illuminating my understanding, then I begin to pray for those things that I ought to be praying for, all right? Okay, then in verse 8, the final verse tonight, we've got the money verse, because notice the end game. Notice the end game here in fruit bearing. Glorifying the Father. You see that? Nod your head. The end game, the end game here is glorifying the Father. Who is the Father in this? The vine dresser, the gardener. Now, what pleases a gardener the most? What is a gardener into? Gardening. Okay? And when a garden is being productive, that's what turns on the heart of the gardener. Would you look at the size of these tomatoes? Right? I mean, would you look at the, can you believe the beans I'm getting out of this row of green beans? That's what thrills the heart of the gardener. What is it that thrills the heart of our Heavenly Father, who is the gardener? You and I being fruitful. Would you look at what Tom is doing and fighting all these people the verse by verse? Look at the size of them, their tomatoes. Right? What brings a real validity and a real meaning to our existence is when you and I are allowing God to do in our lives what he wants to do. Now, as we close here, as we wrap it up, I want you to see this picture. We alluded to it earlier. Four different levels of fruit that Christ has laid out for us tonight. Okay? We have branches that have no fruit, branches that have fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. No fruit, have fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Now, you judge yourself. The verse that I am going to give you out of all the verses in the Old Testament has impacted me practically the most in, in my life this past year. This verse I'm about to give you. 1 Corinthians 11.31. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged of God. That has saved my life this year, okay? Listen, you judge yourself, you will not have to be concerned with God stepping in and getting your attention, all right? So judge yourselves here. Where would you say that you place yourself in those four, category, four categories? No fruit, some fruit. Well, I used to use the Lord's name in vain, but you know, I don't do that anymore, so I guess I got some fruit going on. More fruit or much fruit. Ask the Lord honestly in the quietness of your hearts this week, am I bringing forth that which you want me to bring forth? Are there areas in my life that you want to get to? Are there areas here that you want to purge by cleansing with the water of the word of God? Are there areas that you want to heal? Are there areas you want to put back together? We have discovered tonight that it is God's will to get you to that place where there is much fruit. It is God's will. God has so much more for you. Don't settle. So as you judge yourself and you, well, yeah, I got some fruit going on here. Man, I think I've got some fruit rolling here, but you know, I probably got room for improvement. Then you can know that God has so much more for you that he wants to bring forth much fruit in your life that he's not done with you. This is not all there is. And it is all a byproduct of your relationship with him. Only thing you need to do is not sweat and strive and just, in the energies of the flesh, the only thing you need to do is remain in Christ. Now tune in, because some of you need to get this. You can't plug yourself in, and then rip yourself right back out, and then plug yourself in again, and rip yourself right back out. You can't plug in one or two days a week and forget about the other four or five. That is not going to get the biscuits buttered. 
as we've become fond of saying. We weren't always fond of saying that, but we've become fond of saying that. But that's not going to get it, man. You can't be doing this, I'm the branch in the vine on Sunday and maybe on Wednesday or once, or maybe on, and then you, you go to work and you rip yourself out of the trunk. Man, that is not going to get it. This isn't hard. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Just stay plugged in, man. Remain and abide. Okay? In my estimation, that is the reason most Christians remain unfruitful. They don't just stay in there. Okay? And now remember, too, you can't force fruit. Well, you know, I'm going to be more gentle with annoying people. I'm going to force that smile, man. No! You just hang on to Jesus Christ. You just continue to cultivate your relationship with him. You get to know him better. As your love and appreciation for him grows, so will your desire to please him. And just very naturally, fruit will begin to come forth in your life. That is his promise. You go out to an orchard, I guarantee you, you are not going to hear the branches grunting and grunting and striving and whatever. You're not going to hear anything. The only thing you're going to find them is attached. Attach yourselves to Christ, guys. Remain in him. His father is not coming along with a pair of scissors or a hacksaw, right? He simply wants to come alongside you lift you up when life buries you in the mud and he wants to just you to just allow him to cleanse you and wash you in the water of his word let's pray heavenly father god thank you for revealing your heart to us you're not some old testament deity up there keeping score with a big beard and a stick god you're, you're fa- father you are you are deeply interested in our welfare lord Thank you for sending us your son, the true vine. Help us this week, Lord, to just remain in him. We don't have to sweat. Help us to be still and spend time with him. Let us allow his word to just come and cleanse us from all the gunk that's out there in the junk, God. Wash our hearts in the water of your word this week, I pray that a holy desire, a holy fire would come upon the souls that are here tonight to just desire your word, Lord, in order to know you. Lord, your word says we can't do anything of any lasting value apart from you. So we're asking now for your great mercy and your strength and that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.